Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This time we're looking at a Commodore Amiga A600. So you may be forgiven for thinking this is better than the 500. Well, it was and it wasn't. I think there's an IDE interface in here, so you could stick a hard disk in there. The controller ports are a bit weird over here, like certain types of controllers, you'll struggle to fit them because of uh, the uh, floppy drive point up here, I think. Yeah, it kind of interferes with the port a little bit. And the keyboard is obviously a lot smaller, because this is a really small form factor machine here, you know, they really shrunk it down. And the net result is you're missing the number pad over here. So some of those games that use those particular keys, you could have a problem with. But then again, there might not be that many. Things like flight sims and stuff will definitely use the number pad. But these are a really nice machine and they are well sought after these days because obviously it's got the ID interface so you can uh, you know, boot WHD load, load all your games from you know, a compact flash card really easily. But you can get things like the Vampire 600 uh, and there are a few other accelerators and things. You can get one from Lothrak that adds like either an 020 or an 030. Um, but the Vampire is uh, one of the reasons why these really start selling well over the last few years because uh, everybody wanted to get a Vampire in their Amiga. Anyway, this is the first time looking at one of these on my channel. I've been inside these once or twice in the past. This particular one belongs to Stu Roro, Stuart, uh, a friend of mine and a Patreon. The difficulty here is any connectors that are quite wide, you're going to struggle because of this here. So some people get those little adapters you can, you can get with the ST. I've got some myself. It's just a really short, you know, I don't know, six or seven inches long pair of cables. You plug them in here and then, you know, at a distance you can plug your mouse and your joystick into the ends of the cables. So we've got a floppy drive, so external disk drive as usual, serial, parallel, left right audio, uh, video connector there, 23 pin again, uh, composite video, modular and a standard power socket there. You can see this is not uh, held together very well here, I'm thinking maybe some of the screws are not in or something, I don't know. Because I could have sworn some of these screws here held it in but maybe not, it could be that these clips, can you see that, maybe those clips are broken. I don't know, or maybe it wasn't screwed together properly. And around this side, you've also got the PCMCIA slot, just like the 1200, so that's quite cool as well, actually. Not only have you got the internal ID, I think, you've got a PCMCIA slot as well. So I'll show you what this is doing in a second. I've already uh, played around with this a little bit, not a lot. I haven't had much time, and my health has uh, just been so bad this last few weeks. Um, I've just been coughing and having breathing problems a fair bit. Now, you may think COVID, but I don't know. I got like this about a month or two back, and... I had a COVID test then, my breathing got a bit better and it came back negative, so I don't really know. Anyway, I'm getting the screws out, I'll show you what it's doing in a minute. It gave me a red screen when I first switched this on, and from what I understand, that's kind of the behaviour. It's like you can switch it off and on, you may get a red screen or a black screen, it may not boot at all. And then the next time, it can do, and it's fine, and it's reliable, so it's a bit mysterious. My first thought was actually uh, reset related. I'm wondering if there's something wrong with the reset circuit on these, and it can be a common problem due to corrosion. Now, Stuart did send this off to someone else and had it, uh, let's see where the ribbon is, it's right over there, uh, had it uh, recapped. So you can see down there we've got a connector that just needs to be pulled off. There you go, and that just allows us to lift that up. Um, now, he says the keyboard is not working, and I noticed that myself as well. But you can see it's connected uh, down here okay, so that's a little bit concerning. Uh, anyway, we'll just uh, we'll loosely put that on there. Now we've got the lid off, it'll just make it a bit easier to tear down in a minute. We'll get the board out and stuff and have a look at the state of the board. So we're all connected up, let's uh, power it on and see what happens. There you go, red screen. That's what I had last time actually. But the chances are, after I switch off and on, it may be okay. Yeah, I'm thinking reset actually. Because it's weird, the way you can recreate that exact behaviour of having a red screen there when it's first powered on, it can only be something like reset. But then again, we haven't got a working keyboard. The keyboard uh, does nothing, I don't think. I moved the camera there, by the way, just because uh, yeah, it wasn't very visible. You can see we're getting nothing at all. So the keyboard is non-functional. That might suggest a CIA problem. Although I think there might be a keyboard MCU on these. I'm not sure. Maybe just like the 1200, you know, this little tiny little uh, SMD part. That could be a problem if that's failed. But it could be, you know, corro corrosion related, damage trace. If we check the uh, CIA timers, those are coming back okay. So that's a good sign. The other thing I can do, and I will do now, is I'm just going to power this off, connect up the serial and parallel dongles, and test the serial and parallel port. Because that would also give me some level of confidence that maybe it's not a CIA problem. Thank <laughs> you. 
So I switched it off. These are the Serial Unparalleled uh, dongles I made in uh, a live stream, I think it was. So our serial port's here, so if we just stick that in there. And it's just a loop back, so you can make one of these yourselves and the instructions are actually there in the software. I'll show you that in a second, it tells you which pins to join up. So it's like pin two and three are joined up and then there's three or four others on the serial port. Uh, and on the parallel there's a bunch of pins uh, joined together, let's just try and get that the right way. Um, yeah, there's a, a bunch of pins joined together, but it's the same sort of thing. And uh, if you go into serial parallel, let's do the serial port first. Yeah, there we go. So you can see here which pins, you know, you join those two, and then these three, and then that one to those two. Uh, and it tells you what they are down here. So that shows us that the serial is okay. Let's do the same thing with the parallel. Exactly the same on the parallel, you can see which pins to join there. They're all good. So, in terms of CIA, well, floppy drive's working. Serial parallel working. We could test the audio filter. Let's, let's just test the audio, see what's going on with that. Yeah, so all four channels are working. Let's just put one on, switch the filter off, and on 10 kilohertz. Yeah, I'm not hearing that. I know I am. Yeah, that is working. You get more volume when you've got more channels on. So if I switch all four channels on, yeah, you can hear that very clearly. So the filter is working. That is another indication that uh, the um, CIA is okay, because the, the, the CIA, well, there is a connection, I think, there for the filter on the CIA. Um, and it's related to the 1488 as well, I think. So, so far, everything is kind of looking good. We've just got this mystery as to why we occasionally get weird behaviour. Let's just try a memory test. Now, I did a memory test at some point, and it bombed. Um, completely it gave like an address exception or something. The whole screen just filled up with like an exception here. But again, that was just after a power on. It does seem that after you've had it on for a minute or two and switched it off and on, then it's fine. Yeah, the RAM's coming back okay. Look. So I've got the top of the connector with some long nose pliers. I'm just carefully pulling it up like that on each side. There we go. So that we can just carefully pull that out. Let's inspect that. And if we have a quick look at that, is it worn off? Maybe it is actually, I don't know. You can see it looks very black up here and then hardly visible there at all. So it could be the ribbon that's the issue with the keyboard. Anyway, let's get these uh, screws out of here now. And we've got another screw down here by the looks of things. It's not coming out, it's stuck into the hole. Oh. It's kind of like bigger than the hole. Just leave it there for the moment. That should now mean the floppy drive is free. Yeah, here we go. So we'll uh, we'll disconnect it out the drive, I think. There, disconnect that. Yeah, that was off camera there, but I just you know disconnected that there from the the drive. So the board is now free. Actually, I don't, I don't think there's anything else holding it in. Is there? Kind of wobbling around a bit. Oh look, the shield's come off. Yeah, it might be an idea just to pull this off here like that, so that we can get the shield off more easily here, look. There we go. So I am pleasantly surprised there are hardly any capacitors on this. You've got a bunch here, that's the majority of them. A couple up here near the keyboard connector. And then four or five around here. I can see a little wire down there. That's interesting, so that's been uh, fixed there. And I don't know how well you can see, we've got some corrosion or fluff or something there. So yeah, these have been swapped out, it has been recapped. It's just a question of, uh, well, was any damage left from that recap work? But uh, I'm pleasantly surprised, the board is not looking horrific or anything like that. Having said that, I'm not looking at it up close at the moment. I've got an interesting uh, mark there on the expansion. I'm not sure if it's just a bit of corrosion on the end or whether the pad's gone or what and a couple of the little marks so yeah there's some cleanup work required but uh, yeah this is not not horrific by uh, any stretch of the imagination yes yeah, so this is the area of the 555 you can see we've got the odd wire there so I'm going to need to check all that and those wires and one or two of these components just look like they need a, a reflow really they're looking very grey now Whilst I wasn't that horrified first looking at this, lots of things look like they've been replaced. If you look at the solder points, 
that has been swapped out. Someone swapped uh, Paula there. I think that's Paula. And over here, I think we have Gail, is it? Look at that. That looks like that's been uh, swapped out to me, actually, the solder points. Yeah, it's hard to tell, but the solder points kind of lead me to think that's been swapped over. And it's the same, look at the CPU there. That has definitely been off that board. So, this nail does worry me a little bit, look at that. It does worry me in the sense that a number of things have been removed. Why would you remove the CPU? Uh, solder points there look okay, might need reflowing. That's a CIA, uh, that's the keyboard MCU I think. Uh, and again you can see that's been swapped, can you see the flux around it and stuff as well. Um, the pins don't look too bad there, but that's definitely been swapped out. I've pulled the cover off there just so we can see right into the pins and they all look fine. Everything kind of looks okay around there, but that socket has not been removed from the board. And then up here you can see what I meant about that bit of corrosion. Look at the pins on the top of that IC there. They're pretty grey. There's obviously the odd trace fix and stuff around there. But I think all this work is good. I will go around and check all the supply rails and just measure across each of the caps to make sure they're all okay. So I think in general, all I'm going to do to start with is go around this with some cotton buds and some IPA. Clean up a specific area. So, for example, I'll start here with the, these two patches, you know, IPA, clean, 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 fiberglass uh, pen. Some of the caps here look awful. Let me zoom you in a little bit. Yeah, here, for example, the solder points on those look very, very dull. There's still corrosion there. So, I'll perhaps get a little bit of vinegar as well and then scrub with the um, fiberglass pen. Get a little bit of flux and some solder braid, remove the old solder and just re-solder those. I'll do the same on both bits here and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see a difference. Can you see these pins on these little white uh, resistors? I think they are. They might not be. They might be inductors or something, those. I can't really see what the component designation is for them. Um, but anyway, these little white components here, the solder points on those are awful. So, same thing and any of these, uh, like that cap there, for example, I'll do the same thing all around there. So we'll start over here with uh, just a little bit of vinegar. Now, I don't think vinegar is really needed because this board is very clean. It is very, very clean. Lots of work has been done to this. But uh, anyway, it's just the approach uh, I always go with to start with. So again, this is one of these things that I'll have to do most of the work off camera because I need to see with magnification what I'm actually doing here. I want to see the difference before and after as I actually do it. But anyway, you get the general uh, idea, it's just a case of carefully going over these things. Bear in mind, we've got fixed wires on there, so you wouldn't want to rub over a fixed wire. You may pull it off a wire or pull off, uh, you know, whether it's soldered onto and create further damage. The wire is down here somewhere, so anyway, I'll report back in a minute. The first thing that's got me concerned here is around the 555, because as I said, with the red screen thing, and then you power it off and on, it'll be alright consistently. So, you know, you'd switch it off, come back the following day, switch it on red screen, switch it off and on, be okay. That pointed me towards the, the reset, the 555 here. Uh, and this is where we've got two or three wires and things around here, and, well, there's an issue. Let me just explain. We've got a wire down here that goes to the positive side of that cap. Okay, um, so that's that wire dealt with. But then there's like two or three other bits of wire underneath the cap, and it's confusing as to what's going where. And if one of them goes to this little cap over here on the right, and if I measure between that and the negative of the capacitor, we've got a short. Now it looks like the way it's wired, it's going kind of under. Uh, and because it's going under, it's very easy for a wire like that to short onto either the positive or the negative of the underside of a surface mount cap because there's only a little gap in between the two. It's very easy for wires to short onto that. So anyway, the first thing I need to check is should that cap be joined to the negative of that cap? And then it comes across here to this cap and we've got the same issue. So all three of those are joined together there. Now that could be correct, but it might not be. So I may have to just remove this cap to have a look at where the traces are going, but before I do that, I'm gonna go see if I can find schematics for this. Um, because we can also see where the, if we can find the component designations of these, look, look them up on the schematics and see where they go. You know, should one side be ground, should it not be, should it be a coupling or should it be decoupling across supply rails and things. Depending on where that cap goes down here, this, this trace, it goes to two pins in the middle, doesn't it? Because that one and that one, I think. 
So it might be something to do with the threshold or something like that on the 555. So we can determine if those pins are supposed to be joined together and if they're supposed to go to the positive side of this cap. But when I find that on the schematics, the 555 and these two pins going to the positive of this, I can then look what's on the other side and go, oh, oh, is there supposed to be two ceramics onto that same rail layer? I mean, if this is negative, yeah, these might well be, uh, may well be across the uh, rails there. Um, but then you'd expect that to be joined there if that was the case, and it isn't. It could be a different supplier rail, it could be that this is for, let's say, the threshold or the uh, whatever it is on the 555 there. Um, anyway, you can see I've started to clean around some of these things here with the fiberglass pen. It's, uh, it's looking much, much cleaner. Can you see how shiny they go? So all of this stuff around here, I've had a really good scrub around, but there's loads of debris in between the actual pins, you know, in between the actual components and things sat on the board there. So the next thing I would do is just get some IPA on there and brush it with a toothbrush. Stuart also sent me some uh, Chip Quick Flux, which is brilliant. This is uh, the flux I recommend. It's uh, not cheap. You can buy this a bit cheaper from RS Online. You'll get it for about £12 for uh, five, is it five or is it six tubes? Six tubes like this. So that's uh, probably the best way to go. Now you can get a larger tube, which is about uh, the same price. But if you look at the volume, you have actually get a little bit more. These are all like two, two cc tubes here if you get a large one it's like eight or ten cc or something so yeah you've got more by getting the smaller tubes there but you get more wastage in smaller tubes so it's uh, i don't know you've got to work out what's best for you really anyway thanks very much for that Stuart. that's uh come just when i needed some really um and obviously we're going to be using some of that on here i do need to open a new tube so i'll open one of those in a minute anyway so we just a uh, brush like this here cleaning right in between those components there, it's getting rid of the fiberglass dust and any contamination that's in between them. I cleaned that chip there as well actually, incidentally. I mean look at the colour of that, can you see it's like a whole grey sort of colour. That sort of tells me, yeah this has been cleaned but nobody's gone at it with a fiberglass pen. And uh, a fiberglass pen makes a huge difference to contamination and dirt that's just uh, sitting on there and hanging on and clinging on. So the connectivity around here is actually okay. Those two connections, you know, the middle two on the top side of that chip there, the 555, they do go to the positive side of this cap, that's correct. And on the negative side of the cap, joins to the cap here, joins to the cap there, joins to that one, joins to that one, joins to that one. Also goes through a via to the other side and a pad to another component, a resistor, I think, and that's all okay. So it would appear that that side of things is okay. But I took a sidestep here. A red screen is usually means there's a problem with a ROM. I think it's that ROM checksum problem. So one of the first things uh, an Amiga will do when it boots is, as well as testing the RAM, it will check the ROM. It may check the RAM first, I think, and then check the ROM. Could be the other way around. Um, but it does a checksum. So you know it, it starts from the first address in that ROM, and then uh, stores a value in RAM or somewhere, perhaps even in a register, and then reads the next address and then does some sort of XOR or something against the value it's already got. And it continues to do that till you get to the end. You get like an XOR checksum or something similar. It might not be an XOR checksum. Uh, the net result is it then compares to a value stored within this ROM to determine um, is it exactly as it should be. And if it's not, it will give you a red screen because you've got a ROM problem. Now, things that could cause that, well, you could have a problem with the data bus, a problem with the address bus. Those are the sort of things that will mess things up. But just remembering the fact that when we zoomed in on this, this has been reflowed. There's one pin down here that looks really, really, really dodgy. It looks like it's not flowed. I can see a bit of corrosion around it. It doesn't look like it's soldered. I'm just wondering if that pin is the issue. I'm going to uh, measure on continuity and see where it goes. Is it an address connection? Is it a data bus connection? Uh, retest for a little bit and uh, see see what happens. And I might end up reflowing that. That might be the issue. It might be this side here. Because right now I'm not convinced that there's anything wrong with the reset unless the 555 is playing up periodically. We could scope it, I guess, later. But anyway, change in direction. I think that let's just look at the ROM side of things because that's what it's telling us. It's telling us there's a ROM issue. And I think that's more likely because I'm not sure, even if there was a reset issue, let's say it was not resetting everything on the board fully, 
would it really give us a ROM problem? Well, it could do if the output enable of the ROM is not set properly. But then again, but then again, it must be booted from the ROM in order to run the ROM code. So that makes sense. So it's not like the ROM is not even enabled at the right time, and you would just get a black screen. It wouldn't boot at all. So anyway, let's uh, let's just see. See, I don't think the ROM's the issue, I've, but I've just connected up IDE on a hunch that maybe the buffering for the IDE is the problem. I'm getting the red screen an awful lot now I've got the IDE connected, so I'm thinking that's what it is, actually. It's almost uh, repeatable now, you can switch it off and on, off and on, you get a red screen, then you don't, then you do. And if you watch the LED here, see how that time, how we've got nothing. Let me just uh, cycle the power again. Let's just keep an eye on the LED here. Our red, hang on, we had a red screen then, then it reboot. Look, we had a flash then. And then occasionally it starts to boot. Yeah, it's just come up with a sticky disk in screen. So it's like, you can't see the IDE. Oh, that's a huge clue. That is a huge clue. That whilst this works fine from floppy, look, flash, flash, it was trying to boot and then it's given up. I think uh, the bus transceivers, assuming there are some, for the IDE port are the issue. Now they might be shared with the uh, PCMCIA slot, see that can be a software error. So it's like it started to boot and then uh, it's probably got some dodgy data because one of those connections on the transceiver are not working right. Anyway, it's just a hunch. But I think what I'm going to do at this point is go look at the uh, schematics and PCB layout to see where, well, whether there's some transceivers on there, where they are. My hunch is these. These are really warm. Um, it's worth inspecting in there to make sure none of those pins are shorted because that could be an issue as well. But there are some bus transceivers down here as well, I think. So I've tried a few different compact flashcards here, a few different adapters, a few different cables. I cannot get this to boot from IDE at all. The one thing I've noticed is that chip there, that's 245, is getting incredibly hot, like boiling. Now, it does gate some access through uh, to this chip here, which is... Yeah, that's uh, Denise, I think. Super Denise, yeah. Paula's over the other side, I think. Um, yeah, these three get hot here as well, very, very hot. I'm going to remove these two here. Now, it's going to mean, obviously, I need to take this off, put capture tape all around there, capture tape all around here, and then just remove these two chips. They buffer the uh, CF, uh, you know, or PCMCA slot here. I um, just want to rule those out to make sure those aren't interfering. If we find it boots after that, we know straight away we've probably found the problem. So, as you can see, I've carefully capped and taped off all this stuff around here. Got three layers on uh, both things actually the uh, IDE connector and on the uh, port here. It, I think the chances are we're still going to affect this with heat because it's very difficult to isolate it entirely just because of how close it is. Anyway, let's uh, see if we can get this off, get both of these off here. I just want to see if the behaviour is any different. You could argue I'd have been better off trying to scope things, but these are getting very hot. Look, let's come off already that. Yeah, that's warm. Let's just shift that to the side. It smells a bit corrosion. Yeah, I can smell like electrolytes, so you never know. Maybe one of these caps here has leaked this way. Anyway, let's get this one off. That smell at all. Why is that gone like that there? You can see how easy that came off though. Not very easy. Let's just carefully uh, grab that and move it out of the way. Yeah, I can smell electrolyte. I can smell electrolyte. And while we wait for that to cool down, I'll straighten these pins. Can you see? Look how, uh, how wobbly they are. They are all over the place, so it's a case of just grabbing it a bit at a time and squash and sort of move to the left a little bit. That wants to go right, that wants to go to the left. Did I say left? I meant right, like some of these are left, some of them are right. Yeah, that's not too bad, we've got one or two over here that's a bit bent. 
So I have it booting now. Um, we didn't need to remove these chips. The issue is actually is the kickstart. The kickstart that was on there, and it, I had to do a bit of research because I wasn't familiar with this. It's 37-300. So the issue with this, this shipped in some early AE uh, 600s probably. And it doesn't boot from hard disks more than 40 uh, megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes. Um, later they released 37-350 which support up to 4 gig drives, which is the same as like Kickstart, uh, some of the other Kickstart ROMs, like 3.1 I think will do 4 gig as well. You can go beyond that with uh, various different file systems and things like that. 4 gig is what I was expecting, and that's what these, these are split, it's like a 2 gig and 2 gig. Well, it wasn't booted on either of my compact flashcards here, and they're both sort of set up the same kind of way. Uh, anyway, so we've removed these. I did smell electrolyte around there, so and the pins just look awful. So we'll clean all those up, get those chips back on later. I'm not worried about that at this stage because it's just for the PCMCIA. It was a good thing to rule out because those hadn't been swapped, whereas most of the things on this board appear to have been off. You know, that has been off by somebody else. Even that looks like that's been off. 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 Did I say that? I'm not sure about these. I need to inspect. I think they have actually. Just looking at the points. So somebody swapped more or less most of the chips on here and they haven't resolved it. Now, the other issue we have, and I'm going to home in on that now, is the keyboard. The keyboard does not work at all. If you press the caps lock button, the LED doesn't illuminate, none of the keys work, you can't reset it from the, you know, control Amiga, Amiga, it doesn't do anything. Uh, now, I've pulled this off and inspected the pins there, that's alright, I've put it back on. Uh, I've made sure the connector is okay, I've tried holding it different ways, I've inspected the ribbon, the ribbon looks good. So, I don't think it's just connectivity here, it may well be between here and here, but it could be this chip, but it could also be whatever connects to this chip. I'm not sure if it's serviced by one of the CAAs or something, in terms of a lot like you get on the uh, 500 and the 2000. I'm going to go see if I can find a spare of one of these, 6571, because we may need to swap it. I'm just going to see how much they are, whether there's one available. So this is the following morning here. I've spent a few hours this morning scoping various things here. Um, now I'll show you, I'll show you some of those things in a minute. The keyboard MCU. I, I focused on the keyboard issue here just because I was getting nowhere trying to understand the, the random nature of the red screen and the black screen and and then it's seeming to work, but the keyboard not working. So I thought, well, let's just focus on the keyboard, because the keyboard is a clue. The keyboard may be the answer. Now, the keyboard has not been working at all, but when I started scoping the uh, keyboard data signal, the keyboard clock signal, come out of the MCU there, I saw some activity for the first time when I was pressing the keys. So I thought, okay, well, maybe it needs key presses before you actually get anything going across. Um, now at that point I turned the keyboard over and noticed the caps lock was working. I thought, oh my god, it's working. This is the first time I've seen it working. Now I powered it back off, connected the floppy drive up, and uh, powered it back on again, and the keyboard wasn't working again. And uh, I spent, a few, I don't know, 10 minutes messing around trying to understand. I, I scoped it again, suddenly it started working again. Same thing, connected the floppy drive up, wasn't working again. Powered it off and on, and then suddenly it started working again. So I think the keyboard is actually intermittent. But as you can see, there are columns here that are not working and obviously you've not got the number pad but some of the keys here are not working some of these keys here are not working spacebar works as an example if i press t g b they aren't but like four r f v that works fine as does the column on the other side so that could just be the membrane now i can experiment with that by just moving the membrane around a little bit just to see let's try pressing one of the keys it doesn't work there you go look eight i Okay, so yeah, the membrane is part of the issue there. Let's just uh, move it just a tiny bit. I'm trying to push, put pressure on it one way or the other, just to see if any of those other rows will start working. See, like the eight rows not working there. So, at the very least, it needs a new membrane. Well, this is very strange. What I ended up doing is reseating it a few times. Still no different. Uh, you know, still had columns not working. And then I noticed that if you power it off, let me just see if I can recreate this. If you power it off really quickly, more often than not, you'll just get a boot or a black screen. And at that point, the keyboard doesn't work. Let me show you this. So we're still on a black screen here. It's not working. Yeah? The, 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 the caps lock LED does not go off and on. Now, I've ordered the 555 timer because I am not convinced the reset is happening correctly here. The timing could be slightly out. Again, I'm pressing the caps lock. We've just got a black screen, nothing. Now just watch what happens. So leave it off for a period of time here for maybe six or seven or eight seconds, not very long at all. 
hopefully get a red screen now look and I keep pressing the caps lock the screen is still red the screen is red there you go look at that so if you tap it at the point where you got the red screen the keyboard starts to work now let me just test to see which keys are working so I haven't done anything with it there just pointed the camera up if we're going to the keyboard let's try the keys now see if we've got all the columns I think we have so the membrane might be part of the issue with the columns because obviously I've reseated it a few times here but it would seem that the red screen is absolutely tied into the behaviour with the keyboard uh, what we do know is well the CIA must be fine you can't have a, a CIA that causes a red screen on one second and then when you power it off and on leave it for long enough then it's alright etc etc so this is a really ruddy mysterious behaviour but I think uh, I'm not sure what I think now I think the reset is ultimately the issue here I think the reset pulse is not lasting long enough now I think the cap has been replaced there the 555 has definitely been resoldered but I can't help but wonder if that 555 has been affected by the corrosion could be one of the components around there but I have checked the connectivity and had a, a visual inspection everything kind of looks okay but I'm just thinking it's the 555 I really am I think that the reset is not going on for long enough and I think that's why we get the red screen because something somewhere has not had sufficient time to reset um, but once you get past that the keyboard then works for whatever reason if I mean let's try control Amiga Amiga hang on can we do that yeah that key's working that key's working Control's working, let's, let's quit out of there, and then as you get out of it now. Tell you what, let's just eject, let me do that, eject the disk. We've got an IDE drive connected, let's do system reset, see what happens from there. So the caps lock is still working. I heard it hit the floppy drive, now it's looking at the IDE, the IDE LED is on. So let's just let that boot, now this compact flash card, it uh, just comes up with an empty dashboard. It's because it's 3.1.4 or something. It just won't work with this ROM. I could, uh, if I could be bothered, go and program a 3.1.4 ROM. Uh, anyway, so we're there. Let's now press Control, Amiga, Amiga. Yeah, that's not working, is it? That is interesting. The keyboard's not working now after doing that. Let's see if the mouse is, is it? Yeah, the mouse is working. So the keyboard, hang on, the keyboard's back again. That's really weird. Try control Amiga Amiga again. Yeah, the caps lock light stuck on now. That makes me wonder if the keyboard reset is the issue here, actually. Yep, yeah, same exact behaviour. You can get the keyboard back by powering it off long enough, waiting for a red screen to come when you power it back on, and then following the red screen. If you just leave it, leave it on the red screen, it does what I believe is a kind of a watchdog. It's probably done by the CPU more than anything, but uh, it ultimately it might be. Uh, I don't know how that's happening actually. I need to look at the schematics, but there is like a reset happens if you leave it on the red screen but as you tap this while you're on the red screen as soon as it resets and goes black this starts working instantly that leads me to think it's all about the reset signal here actually and I think we kind of evidenced that in the sense that we knew all the keys were working and we uh, soft rebooted it uh, via the uh, software rather than powering it off or anything like that and then control Amiga Amiga was causing the keyboard to become unresponsive so anyway I'm focused on uh, KB reset. Now this little chip here is, I think it's like a NAND or something, although it shows the inputs inverted and the output normal, which is a bit weird, but I think it's a NAND. Uh, and it's three inputs, one output. So you've got the three keys, they connect directly to the uh, places on the membrane there to detect which keys have been pressed. And then it goes through a transistor or two, and I'll show you on the schematics. Then you get your KB reset signal. So I'm not going to be able to show you everything at once here. So what I'll do is I'll film and then I'll show you the meter readings at the same time and overlay it over the screen or something like that. So if I press the, uh, well get ready first, we'll measure pin one. So this is the first input and I'll show you the meter in a second. If I press control, you can see it goes down to a low, you let go and it goes up to a high. And pin two is the left Amiga. As you can see, it goes from high to low, 
and then back to high again. And the final pin is pin 13 up here, second to last. And the right hand Amiga key, hold that down, it goes to a low, you release it, it goes to a high. So we know the signals from the keyboard membrane are getting there. So the next thing to do is just check the output of that. Now, that's a little bit hard to do because you've got to press three keys and be measuring at the same time. I'm not sure I can carry that one out, actually. I'm not sure I've got enough hands to do it. But we can check it's in the right state now, I think, and then maybe follow it. I'll show you the schematics now. Follow it further on and just check the other components around there because it might not necessarily be this chip here. It could be the next stage. There's a transistor. It might be, I think it's one of these here, actually. So one of these could be the issue. So here's that little excerpt of the schematics here. So those are the three pins we've just been checking on the uh, 74F27 here. Uh, and as I say, I think it's a NAND, so the output's inverted, but it looks like it inputs, it, on this here, the way this is shown, the inputs are inverted. So coming out of here, the next thing I've done is just check to the base of this transistor, we have that connectivity there. Measuring the voltage there, it's like 0 0.0 something, 3 of a volt, very, very low. Um, and then I thought, well, what's going on here? This pull-up, here because if these are all low you'd expect this to be high actually uh, although they're all high aren't they so uh, I don't think about this they're all high the conditions met <sighs> yeah so a uh, low technically could be correct but look at this uh, resistor here so I thought the next thing we'll do is just check this pull up now if I measure from the base of this transistor to VCC in resistance mode I get mega ohms not 10k. That makes me think that this pull up here might be the issue that we're lacking this pull up. So I'll get the ESD wrist strap on, carry the board back over to the mat there, reflow this IC but also check the via coming from pin 12 to make sure it's going through the board to the other side and going through the resistor. Make sure that resistor's got one side to VCC and uh, make sure it doesn't measure as 10k. So I'll just get a uh, smidge of flux, that's way too much flux, I need to get a little bit of flux on that side. It's that side that I'm worried about reflowing, the other side doesn't look bad actually. Um, we'll reflow that first and I'll just flip the board over and I'll measure from that via just clean the tip. That's probably too much actually. And uh, yeah, just dab into these like that. I don't know why they look so dull. I mean, it could be because not all the corrosion has been cleaned off there. Anyway, that I think is looking a lot better. I'll expect with magnification, we'll clean it with the cotton bud. Now we're off the carpet here, we're just on the case. I think I've discovered the issue. Reflowing that made no difference. The connection from the via to the 10K pull up on the other side is okay. Let me just uh, show you this, hang on a sec. Uh, and in case you're wondering, I've got the positive of my uh, logic probe just connected carefully. Uh, so the floppy power connector, I'll show you that in a second. You've got to make sure you don't short it to ground. Now just watch this. This is the base of the transistor that goes to produce the KB reset signal. Just watch. Look at that, right? It's high. It's red screen, red screen, red screen, red screen. I'll turn it goes off. Red screen, red screen, red screen, red. Gone black. Do you see it go low? This is the issue. It's been held in keyboard reset and it's fighting against the reset signal, I think. I think you've got like a, a almost like a reset loop going on kind of thing. But the CPU, for whatever reason, is able to come out of reset because the 555 is, uh, you know, its reset signal has gone low. Uh, sorry, high. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we've made some progress here. I am sure that's what it is. If we just power cycle it while it's warm, we might not get a red screen and therefore, look, it's not high. And it's booting again as normal. So I think we've got to the bottom of this. The one thing that's annoying with this, and it's just experience, I guess, somebody who's looked at this previously has replaced all sorts of chips on here. You know, as I mentioned at the start, so many, most of the chips have been off this to try and resolve this problem. What you've got to look at is the behaviour. <clears throat> you know, if the keyboard's playing up, you know, they'd swap this out thinking it was the keyboard, you know, so you can't see it. They'd swap the keyboard MCU up there and the CIA, probably jumping onto the idea that the, the, the keyboard is the clue. But you've got to look at the behaviour as well in the sense that once you get past the red screen and let it reset itself via its own little watchdog, and I don't think it is a watchdog, it's actually the CPU that does the reset there, I think. 
like a retry, you know, it shows the red screen from period of time, and then you get a re reset, um, presumably done in software. Um, and it works okay, so that was a clue to me, right from the very, very start of this, that the reset circuitry was probably where we would end up. And uh, yeah, I strongly believe that's what it is. So the question is, is it this, or is it this? Well, the transistor measures normally, if I'm honest. If I measure, I'll show you in a sec, we'll measure using the diode test, it kind of looks like a normal transistor. But then again, this is intermittent, isn't it? Whatever it is, when it's warmed up, it's all right. When it's cold, it's not. So maybe I should be doing the measurements after I've let it power down for a minute or two. Uh, and the other obvious thing to check here, and I'm glad I did, is I don't think it's this, and I don't think it's this. If we have a look at the first pin there, now this is from the uh, MCU connection, so it scans you know, one of the keys here. If we just power this on, we've got a red screen, look it's low, can you see that? It's low, low, which means it's pressed I think, low, and it's gone high, with the black screen. So. Oh, this gets even more confusing. So maybe the reset is not the issue. We're simply going back down the chain here now, looking at the keyboard MCU, because the fact that that change state shows us that the keyboard MCU is kind of jammed on power on and going, oh, hang on a minute, all the keys have been pressed. All the keys have been pressed. You're pressing Control Amiga, Amiga, do a reset. Which would point back over here again. So, oh, I'm just going around in circles with this. I seriously am. I am uh, wondering what, what on earth I've taken on with this. So the issue is, maybe this is not getting its reset signal properly. Maybe that's what the issue is. But I think the connectivity is good. So again, we're back to, is it a timing thing with the 555? Is the reset pulse not long enough, perhaps, to give this time to reset? And because this doesn't reset, this is then stimulating a keyboard reset, and the whole thing's just... I don't know, it's getting in a mess because the reset is not correct. Maybe the reset's going to end up with nothing to do with this. But it's certainly a clue in order to be able to backtrack and go, well, actually, this is generating a keyboard reset. Why is this generating a keyboard reset? So I removed the uh, 10 nanofarad cap from there. You can see it here. Now, the underside of it was absolutely filthy. So I have cleaned it with the fiberglass pen. Uh, I'll just show you. I've measured it as well. It is coming out correct. So it's, uh, it's difficult to get uh, both things onto the shot once here. Just hold it on there. Can you see that? 10.2. As you can see, what I did there is just heat the solder on one side, remove the solder on the pad on the other side. So we just need to add some solder to that bottom side and then just level off the uh, top side. It's very difficult to show you this sort of stuff, but I might be able to sort of show you me removing that one in a minute. I've got to be careful because there's little wires on the tops of each of those joining to the other side of that centre cap. I'm just going to get quite a bit of solder. So I've got some on that pad there, I didn't mean to do that, I can remove that in a second. Just heat this cap and try and slide it to the left. It's easier said than done. There you go, look, it's come off, look. So just very carefully heat this point with a bit of solder. There we go. Flip it onto the mat, it's off. Yeah, I don't think this capacitor is behaving normally. Let me just zoom you out. You won't be able to see the cap. But just watch what happens. We get like a weird charging thing going on, which you'd expect of a, a through hole. Let's just flip those around. Because it's not a very large, this. It should be, I don't know, 100 nanofarads or something like that. See the meter? Look, it's going up, 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 up. Charged. So it's almost like someone's put a 10 microfarad cap or something there. See that? That is crazy. That is not right. I'm going to go look at the schematics and just work out what size I need to fit. So it's just the same after that. So I think what I'm going to do is remove this multiple input NAND. Uh, now, because it's a NAND, it might not boot at all without this. Thinking about it, it might induce a keyboard reset. Uh, we'll soon find out. Anyway, let's let's get it off there. I can always put it back on. God, it stinks around there. I'm not sure if someone's uh, cleaned this with acetone or something in the past. It's got that kind of smell. The yeah, VCC pen up there looks very dull. It's like a really dark grey. Anyway, let's make sure there's no shorts. I'm just going to try it without it to see how it behaves without that little chip. Well, it was worth ruling out, but 
you still get a red screen when you first power it on when it's cold uh, and it behaves just the same way so we can rule out that and the change left of it you know previously I thought that maybe the keyboard MCU was causing this because we did see lows as if those three keys had been pressed there but this would suggest not because that's now isolated well in terms of the reset side of things it could still be the keyboard MCU that's the issue here so I think we are back to thinking it's a reset actually <laughs> I mean, I've gone round and round and round on the reset stuff with this um, the KB reset goes to Gale as far as I can see and uh, I've mentioned connectivity it's from the uh, that pin there which is the collector yeah that's right the collector on this transistor it's a 2N3904 uh, and let me just show you let me just uh, logic uh, probe this so bear in mind we're missing this chip down here but anyway we should still get the reset from the 555 so just watch the colour it's high it never went low we've got a red screen still got a red screen now it's a black screen so without a reset it's recovered on its own but we're still high we never saw a low now just have a look at this pin here let me just uh, is it this pin here is it that pin there I forget which one it is now maybe that one is it high hang on one of these does toggle high low did you see that switch it off and on watch high low that's the reset pulse coming in on the base I think high low so you would expect to see high low or low high or something here and we just got high so the answer is that transistor that transistor is the issue I think I don't know what else it could be it does measure okay though which is really mysterious now there is a resistor I think a pull up or something so we'll check that that's there and hasn't shorted or something like that so you can see the meter there if we just measure from uh, across there like that we've got a diode reading got a diode reading hang on a minute we've got a reading that way and we've got a reading that way so maybe it is that uh, yeah I think it's that transistor actually because the one below is the same type can you see that and we only get a reading there and there on this one we kind of get a reading wherever you go doesn't matter which orientation I think hang on now we've not got a read in there, that's interesting. But we'd have a read in there and a read in there as well as there. So, yeah, I need another one of those. I might have some of those, I'm not sure. I'm going to go look to see if I've got a spare. So, we could be barking up the wrong path again, but I'm going to remove this transistor and measure it off the board and swap it out. I think I've got an equivalent here. It's NPN. I know what's going to happen, I'm going to take it off and measure it on the tester it's going to say, yep, it's a transistor, it's normal. Yeah, there we go, it's off. Well, I've spent about another hour and a half messing around with this, testing various transistors in my collection, so I've had an MPN and then I took the one off, it's okay, which is what I thought would happen. So anyway, I have got a replacement if I need it, let me just move this board a little bit. Uh, what I have discovered from testing the pads without the transistor on there, we've got no connection to ground. The bottom pin there I think is it yeah that that's the reset signal K KB reset that goes to Gale down there largest uh, large quad flat pack right near the corner bottom end of the board down there I'll show you that in a second yeah and then the other pin connects to the transistor here the pin on the left should go to ground we've got no ground it should also go to the left pin on that one that should go to ground the left hand pad here is the issue it's not connected to ground I'll show you uh, so you can't quite see them on the ground. If I go to ground there that hopefully you can see, there's no ground. Uh, the left hand pin on this transistor here should also go to ground. And there is no ground. I'll test from the ground you can't see down there, but there is no ground. Now they are however joined together, as they should be. What I can do is we have a ground on this cap here, which was fed with a wire. So I'll just stick another little wire here 
around here to that top pin. Since these two are already joined these transistors on the left hand pins there, that should solve it. And hopefully, fingers crossed, this just fixes the thing. We might get rid of the red screen issue, keyboard back to normal. The whole issue here is it, the reset has not been working properly. So, the bad news is I want to keep this system. <laughs> the good news is it's working. I think that was it. I'm, I'm pretty confident that was it, because as soon as you see a fault like that, like a missing ground on something, straight away, alarm bells are ringing, you're like, yeah, that's going to be it. That is going to be it. Uh, it's booting every single time. I've not had a single red screen. The interesting thing is it was frozen on a black screen, stuck in reset without this little chip. So, that was a valuable test. The fact when we removed this, it was still behaving just the same. And the issues we saw with that, the whole keyboard reset thing, you know, the keys being triggered when the thing wasn't on and all that, you know, I hadn't actually booted. I think what was happening here is the keyboard MCU was kind of like starting because it was in a high. It had gone from a low from the power, the power on state and then to a high on its own. So the keyboard was starting to crash, if you like. The keyboard control was crashing registering as if keys were being stuck down which was trying to fire the keyboard reset so you had a kind of like weird loop thing going on but it couldn't actually reset because the transistor here was not able to drive the reset signal properly on gale does that make sense it's like you've got two weird things going on as a result of not having a reset it's kind of similar to what we saw on that atari st where if you've got a reset not getting to where it needs to be Think weird things can happen. Now on the ST, because the side of the uh, board there relates to video, the glue chip, the glue chip was not getting a reset signal, which is why we had no video, but the CPU was trying to boot, but because that area of the board hadn't been reset on the ST, certain things were, like this here, certain things were kind of behaving, like doing stuff, unexpected behavior. They hadn't been reset. They hadn't been, you know, put in line with the normal, sequence of processing they were just kind of in a spurious state because it hadn't been reset and that was causing the bus conflict i think on there which is why the data bus looked awful on the st on this system here it's kind of able to start booting some of the things have kind of like had enough of a pause from the initial power on to go all right let's get going kind of thing but they've not all been reset at the same time cleanly with a specific delay there to make sure and then release like off you go you know start whistle kind of thing um, or start gun you know start the race so that everything starts at the same time which is why we're getting really weird behavior with the keyboard um, and the keyboard obviously as I say was influencing the KB reset signal as well which is just confusing matters but I am confident that that is now 100% so the only thing I need to do other than clean up the work I've been doing here is reintroduce these two chips here and then just finish cleaning around the board but yeah I'm confident I think this is working and the other behavior you get with this let me just show you if I switch this on and then press the caps lock look straight away you get a flash but then you also get that if you're not getting that flash there unless there's something on your keyboard ribbon or the keyboard MCU I've switched it off now hang on it's going to be the reset we were not getting a reset use your LED there as an indication so the final thing we need to do here now is get these chips back on. I'm just going to clean up here first of all with a bit of braid to get lots of uh, flux around there. I'm leaving that cap to take there because I'm going to need that in a minute just to help protect the uh, PCMCA socket here. So I skirted over showing you the soldering of that. This chip here, I positioned slightly further up this way to get it away from here, just to make it a bit easier to solder. Uh, but they're nice and straight, and the solder points are good, I just need to clean them up. But I can show you reflowing uh, this now, and just get a little bit of solder there. Um, you could just drag along like this here. As long as you've got good flux, I mean, you see I've got a bridge there. As long as you've got good flux and not too much solder, and be careful not to touch that. Or you can just bob in and bob out like that. Anyway, that's looking a lot better. It was somewhere around here there was a bit of corrosion. So I'll just inspect that with magnification. I'll do the same thing on the other side as well, I think, just for good measure. And then we'll clean up and I'll show you the result.
So whilst cleaning up here I spotted this, can you see this? This is a bit of corrosion on that trace. So I am literally just going to scratch off the solder mask. It's primarily just the solder mask that's worn off because you can see the copper doesn't look too bad below but that via is obviously uh, where it's come through here. We'll just go over it with the fiberglass pen just a little bit. There we go. And we'll just coat that with a bit of solder. Job done. It's just a little bit of stubborn oxidisation or corrosion, so I'm just going to go over this with the eraser, just see if we can get it off there. Maybe it's more stubborn than I'm thinking. It could be some actual corrosion. Yeah, it's not coming off, is it? So let's uh, just get a bit of uh, deoxit on there. Give it a go with that. Might have to scratch this with my uh, scratchy tool. Yeah, you can still see it's there. May as well clean the whole thing with the deoxy now so we've got it on there. Yeah, that is corrosion actually. Um, which is amazing. The gold must have worn off there or something because gold does not uh, easily corrode. You can see we've got a join across there. It's uh, really odd. I'm tempted to solder that single connection actually, but I'm just going to leave that as is. I'll just point it out to him because what you could do is just do what I was going to do: stick a piece of captain tape there, a piece of captain tape on that side, and then just solder and use drag some of the solder right over that one pin. It may well be that there's a join because there's a slightest amount of the trace still there on the right hand side, but yeah. Anyway, that will not clean up any more than that. And in case you're wondering, you can see it's a Rev 1.3 June bug with a J, as in the month June. And we've got all the initials there, the people that uh, worked on this. Fish, Lolly, very interesting. So we'll get the board back in. There was no bottom shield with this, I'm not sure whether it would have originally had any or not. It's a bit of a pain to get this board in because you can see you've got to pull this here, there you go, to let the uh, joystick uh, ports fit out the side there. So it's a Panasonic JU253043P. Look at that. A little bit of IPA on a cotton bud. Try and get it to squeak. And the same thing on the top head here. Be very careful not to pull the top head up too far. And don't slip past the sides of the head and push it because you'll uh, bend you know, the fitting the way it's actually sat. Molly Coats EM30L. Yeah. And we'll just get a little bit around here. As soon as we stick your disc in, it will move around and distribute itself, but yeah, you don't need a lot. That should do it, I think. If you had problems with the disc change, you know, it didn't detect a disc change, you want to just clean the switches. There's going to be a switch down there. You can just see, get some contact cleaner into that, and you've got one over here and for good measure just give the uh, track zero sensor there a bit of a blow <sighs> like that so one of the final things we need to do here is clean around these components here because they are uh, they just look a little bit dirty so i'll uh, wipe these with a fiberglass pen then wipe over with some vinegar and uh, a toothbrush with ipa and stuff afterwards uh, cleaning with a bit of vinegar Just mop that up and then I'll uh, clean it with IPA. Mm -hmm. 
so final look at this area here. Uh, yeah, I got a, a reasonable large blob of solder on each of those there for that wire. I'm not too bothered about that, that's fine, it's tidy, it's clean. The chips here are looking a lot better, everything around here is good now. And up here is looking a lot tidier as well, all the dull points on these have gone. The solder on that cap there, it looks a little bit dull, but there's no, you know, there's no corrosion or anything on it. It's uh, fine. I think it's probably the solder that's been used there, actually, because someone has reflowed that as they've joined a wire to this cap here. So, as I said at the start, this has been recapped, so we don't need to worry about changing the capacitors on this. One of the things that doesn't look so great on here is this chip here. Whoever replaced that originally uh, mislined it a little bit, so it kind of it just looks a little bit odd. If you look at the solder points, if you look at the solder points from the right angle, it's not too bad, but it is not square on the board. Can you see that? And finally, over here is looking super clean and tidy. So I've been testing this uh, long enough now to feel comfortable. This is okay. So I'll remove my hard disk there. So a few things I wanted to show you that I forgot to film earlier. Uh, we're connected to a ground here, you know, so any of these uh, metal parts on the ports here, you could connect your logic probe or your scope ground to. Uh, now I've got the scope here, the portable one, uh, I've got it to times one on the impedance setting here. And uh, one of the things I did early on, to rule out the MCU, this is talking about ruling out the MCU when you get keyboard issues here, you can see this little resonator here this is a crystal resonator it's two pins and both pins go to uh, this here the keyboard MCU there's also a capacitor on either side the ca caps are probably on the underside of the PCB so when I say that the caps go to either side there'll be a cap connected to this side here like 22 picofarad and the other side of it will go to ground and it's the same on the other side there so I'm measuring the bottom pin on that resonator you can see we've got this little uh, sine wave here it's quite low in voltage, you know, amplitude level, but that's what you would expect. Incidentally, if you try and scope the other pin, I'll show you this, hang on, you get kind of nothing. I found that a number of times. I'm not exactly sure why. Somebody more experienced would be able to explain why. But, uh, yeah, one side of that crystal, um, the bottom side, in my case, nearest the diode, you can see we have got some oscillation there. So that was one of the first things I did, just to make sure that that MCU has got a clock. Now the next thing I did, looked at the pinout of this MCU here, the keyboard MCU, and the 8520 RCIA here, because from experience on the A500 and the 2000 uh, and the 4000 as well, you've got a couple of pins on this MCU here, one is a clock, an output clock for the keyboard, uh, for the data, it's like a data clock, and the other one is the data signal itself, so two different things, a clock and some data, it's like a serial connection between this chip and the CIA. The CIA, you know, has got uh, two pins, one of them that the clock will pass through to, and the other one the data passes into. So, just off the top of my memory, from this corner down here, it skip the first pin, and it's the next pin down. So if I just scope that, I'll show you the output of this. So if I press some keys, you will see it's not very clear on the scope, but you can see little peaks as data is actually going across. If you change the time base, it's easier to see. And the other pin, and I'll stick an annotation up to tell you what these are, whether it's the data or whether it's the clock, because I forget. Again, if we press lots of keys, you will see on the scope capture that we've got pulses going across there. So as I say, one of these is the data, one of them is the clock. And of course, you can measure the connectivity over here. And I'll show you the schematics that reflect the things that you've been looking at here. So you can see the 6570 here. Here's the reset signal. Now the reset signal actually comes from Gale, um, as I mentioned a minute ago. And you can see these two pins here, KB data, KB clock. And if I zoom right in, you can see it's pin 41 and pin 42. So that's how the MCU communicates with the CAA to tell you which keys have been pressed. Now it's quite simple this MCU, if you look to the right side, all these connections down here, they just go into the keyboard connector there, and it's a matrix, you know, rows and columns, so it's, you know, it puts a signal out on one and scans back on another, and it can determine, you know, whether, if you've got a key pressed, you know, you're gonna join those two row and column contacts, um, and it does this very, very fast, you know, on a continuous sort of period as you press keys, so it can determine which keys have been pressed, and then it passes it via the serial connection to the uh, CIA. 
And as I showed earlier, the Control Amiga Amiga 3 connections go to that uh, NAND there, which is what we started to look at and remove that. And that's when I obviously then followed up with the 555 here, because that you know the output of that uh, NAND, you know, you've got a reset signal there. You can reset the reset circuitry with Control Amiga Amiga. Uh, and ultimately, obviously, you've got a KB reset. That's the, what this 555 here produces. Um, and that goes to Gale. And obviously, without that, your system's not going to reset properly. It's a bit awkward trying to get this out because of the uh, angle I'm on here. There we go. A little bit on one side, a little bit on the other. It's from one of my 2000 boards, this actually. Oop. Yeah, you don't want to do that, you'll bend the pins. Pins are straight, that's okay. We'll get his ROM back in, it's right aligned here. So pin one's on the left, but you've got to have it right aligned because the socket is bigger than the chip. I'm not sure that's in. There we go. I cleaned the legs up on that uh, chip earlier, by the way, with a fiberglass pen. Yeah, so I can see the couple of screw points there that hold the, the shield down and the board in. Let's get those in. So the super easy to assemble is you've got two slightly longer screws there, like that, that just hold the drive on one side here. You can see the screw there, it's got like quite a wide head on it, and that holds the drive through to the shielding and through the board into the case. I can lift this plastic thing up on both sides. This is where we've got to hope that this ribbon is okay because as you saw earlier we did have some rows and columns missing but I did find after reseating it like this pushing it down as far as it'll go and then push the housing just make sure it's flat all the way it is. Don't pull this at all at that point you've got to be very careful not to stress that connection out We'll just sit that there, I think, and I think it hinges at the back. So the other thing I forgot there was to clip that blooming cable on, didn't I? You know, this little thing here goes onto the motherboard and gives you your LEDs. Yeah, you can just about see it there. So we'll just clip that on. That's it. And if we switch it on, see we've got power. I tested this before with the hard disk, by the way. So it's come up with a sticky disk and screen. Let me uh, stick something in there. Here we go, June. You knew I was going to stick that in. So, boo, no problem. Disk drive is okay. Uh, yeah, as I say, I tested the uh, disk LED here before, and that was working fine. Fantastic, that's working. The other things I did that I didn't show, I did off camera, I measured the voltages on the caps. So all of the electrolytics on the board measured across the positive and the negative. So, for example, on... Um, you know, the ones on the right hand side had minus 12 across one cap, plus 12 across another, plus 5 across the cap somewhere else, 2.5, you know, 2.3-ish, 2.35-ish volts across one of the ones in the middle of the board that uh, provides the audio bias. And then the audio coupling caps at the back, again, 2.3-ish uh, volts were across those. So I know all the caps are okay, caps have been replaced by the previous person that's, uh, you know, worked on this extensively. Dirt and grained in there, and of course, the other thing that uh, can help if you get a bit of IPA in there, just use a toothbrush. There you go, dirt's coming out. Look, it's looking good. It's a little bit of dirt around that text. So final test of the keyboard after reassembling. F10's not working, is it? So you saw F10 wasn't working there, but also the Amiga key, the control key, the left shift key, the left alt key. There were a number of keys related to the uh, row or column that related to and I reseated it a number of times couldn't get it working at all now it's what I said at the start of the video that we probably would need to trim a tiny bit off so I've trimmed that it's like a millimeter one millimeter off the bottom and that's it it's perfect now 
And as you can see, our ST is working. Oh, sorry, uh, Amiga, I meant. Uh, hang on. Is this an ST or is this an Amiga? Let's just go into A. Let's try B. Oh, yeah, there we go. It's uh, loaded uh, my ST disk there. Uh, quite why it's having a, a flicker thing, I don't know. Let's try. Yeah, so let's go to phone. It's having a bit of a flicker fest there, I'm not sure why. So this is an Atari ST uh, program here. Be interested to see whether it works. Well, the decruncher seems to be working, look. Shareware version, continue, unregistered. Yeah, there you go, you can run the ST software on the Amiga. Yeah, did you know that? <laughs> uh, this is ancient, this uh, bit of emulation software as well. So yeah, it's a phone cost thing to calculate here. You know, you put your mobile number in, your duration, and it basically tells you how much uh, your phone call will cost. Yeah, you need an external drive for this. I'm not sure why A doesn't work, and why it needs an external drive, but yeah, so the external drive, as I say, it's one of my ST discs in there. It's got a few utilities, the phone one you've just seen. So I went into this uh, video here with a lot of apprehension. I might not have expressed that at the beginning of the video, but I was a little bit nervous about this because A, somebody else had worked on it, and the chap that had been working on this, he's had it for 12 months, believe it or not. I think it is. It's certainly over six months. It's an awful long time. And uh, it was one of these things, you know, he'd put it on the back burner. So uh, I just spotted some more dirt that needs cleaning off there, actually. Yeah, so it was like a back burner repair where he did the recap, but... He then encountered the problems we've seen, uh, namely uh, the red screen thing and I think the keyboard playing up as well. Because I think that's probably why he swapped the CIA and the uh, MCU. But uh, yeah, ultimately this is a, a good example of why just swapping things to try and resolve a problem if you don't know where to look is not the best thing to do. The best thing to do really is to stop in your tracks and have a think about the behavior. What's what's going on? What is the behavior? Well, in the case with this, there was the red screen thing, but it wasn't just a continuous, you know, every time you switched off and on, you had a red screen. If you let the red screen disappear, the system would then boot. That was a clue in its own right. Why would you get a problem when you first power it on, but then not a problem uh, a minute later, not even a minute later, 20 seconds later? Why would it then boot? Why would things work? And then when you switch it off and on, um, the same sort of thing, I think it was like 50-50, you need the 50% chance of getting the red screen or 50% black screen, it wouldn't do anything, switch it off and on again and then it would boot. So that gives you a clue that it's certainly something timing related and something um, that is occurring at the start of things, you know, that when you first power it on, hence why we started looking at the reset and uh, that was my first thought, my very 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 first thought when I saw the behaviour was I think it's going to be a reset problem, but I uh, jumped around a little bit because as I checked things, things started to look okay in terms of the reset, but ultimately, yeah, it was the reset. It's another example of Occam's razor. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me say that, but you know what? Had he just uh, sat down and thought about the whole Occam's razor and, uh, you know, the simplest explanation being the most likely, well, what was the issue with this? Well, it needed recap. We had some capacitors here and some capacitors over here. Well, the reset is where the capacitors here are. So it kind of stands to reason when you tie in the behavior with the red screen. Thank you very much for Stuart uh, entrusting me with this repair. It will be going back to him on uh, Monday. It's uh, Saturday today, actually. It arrived yesterday, so I haven't spent much time. Spent an hour yesterday, I think, maybe an hour and a half playing around with it. And then today, you've seen majority of the uh, repair here. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found the video interesting. If you would like to support the channel, please see the Patreon and coffee links down below. You can either buy me a coffee or just one dollar a month it makes a huge difference to be able to uh, do the videos on this channel. It's uh, Patreons, all the support of my Patreons and donations and things are what keep the channel going. So thank you very much to everyone who supports me. I'll catch you in the next video.